the beginning. There we go. Okay, so I was thanking everyone for joining the webinar. So um, thanks again, everyone, for joining to discuss putting green leases into action, uh, hosted by the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project, the Institute for Market Transformation, and Unico Properties. So today's webinar topic is green leases. Green leases, or energy-aligned leases, address energy efficiency issues and the split incentive between building owners and tenants. You'll hear from three speakers on the webinar today. My name is Lauren Smith, and I'm a program associate with the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project, or SWEEP. We'll also hear from Andrew Fearman from the Institute for Market Transformation, or IMT, and Adam Knopf from Unico Properties. Andrew will present on green leasing strategies for commercial building owners, property managers, and tenants, as well as the Green Lease Leaders Program. Andrew works in IMT's commercial real estate division, where he helps the private sector access and utilize energy efficiency best practices. He designs and runs the Green Lease Leaders Recognition Program with the Department of Energy and writes about cutting edge practices in green leasing and energy code compliance. As part of the City Energy Project, he models the impact uh, energy efficiency program and policies can have on cities and large real estate portfolios. His background includes experience working with a variety of green certification and benchmarking tools, including time spent reviewing and developing the Energy Star certification for buildings. And Adam Knopf will present on how the use of green lease language in commercial real estate leasing and operations has helped Unico Properties overcome the split incentive and dramatically increase their portfolio's energy efficiency. Adam is the Senior Sustainability Manager for Unico Properties. A commercial real estate investor and full service operator, he oversees Unico Sustainability's work in the Rocky Mountain region and his responsibilities include developing, implementing, and managing green building best practices in energy efficiency and renewable energy. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Adam's work has played a pivotal role in making Unico's 13 million square foot portfolio 34% more energy efficient than the national median. He has also led Unico's entrance into the solar energy market by launching the company's first solar array property upgrade. His efforts have led Unico to win several industry awards, including USGBC Colorado's Greenest Real Estate Company of the Year. So on a logistics note, uh, during the webinar, there are two ways to ask questions and provide comments. Uh, you can type your question into the comment box in your navigation pane, or you can use the raise hand feature, which will sig signal for us to unmute you to ask a question. We will answer questions at the end of the presentation where we have some time allocated for Q&A, um, but you may enter your questions into the chat or comment box as they arise, and we'll go through them at the end. Before we get into green leasing, I'll be providing a brief overview of the Buildings Efficiency Program at SWEEP. I'll also go over some important developments in commercial energy efficiency across the region, uh, which all lend to green leasing in one way or another. The Southwest Energy Efficiency Project advances energy efficiency in a six-state region, which includes Arizona, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. These are SWEEP's program areas. Uh, the program areas they do overlap occasionally, but the buildings program in general supports uh, building energy codes, net zero energy, benchmarking programs, and other efforts aimed at increasing efficiency in new and existing buildings. We work in residential, commercial, and multifamily building markets. Well, looking specifically at commercial building initiatives, these are some of our focus areas. SWEEP supports energy code adoption and compliance at the state and local levels. In our region, we have states with statewide building codes and others where codes are adopted locally. For existing commercial buildings, we work with local governments and other groups to promote benchmarking programs, uh, mandatory and voluntary, and energy efficiency upgrades. We also work with utilities to address data access issues and to improve commercial utility programs. 
Uh, finally, we work with the Department of Energy to deploy resources such as the Buildings Performance Database, the SEED platform, and the Green Lease Library. For the next few slides, I'm going to walk you through some key updates in commercial efficiency in the Southwest. With respect to building energy codes, we're starting to see more cities and states looking at the latest editions of the energy code. The 2012 IECC and the 2015 IECC, uh, which reference ASHRAE 90.1, 2010, and 2013. Uh, Nevada has adopted the 2012 code, which is effective next month. And in Colorado, Denver, Aurora, and Boulder County are just a few jurisdictions considering the 2015 IECC. In Nevada and Colorado, SWEET facilitates energy code compliance collaboratives where uh, stakeholders collaborate to address energy code issues. SWEEP has also formed the Regional Codes Leadership Group, which does the same thing at the regional level. And we have representation from each state in the region. We are also seeing increased interest in measuring commercial energy code compliance. And we're working with state energy offices to plan targeted assessments. Uh, next, I'll briefly touch on the City Energy Project which is a joint initiative of uh, the National Resources Defense Council and IMT. The City Energy Project is a national initiative to increase energy efficiency in buildings. And there are two cities from the Southwest participating, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, and Denver, Colorado. Both cities are currently implementing voluntary benchmarking programs. For Salt Lake City, on July 15th, so coming up, uh, Mayor Becker will be hosting the city's first annual Skyline Challenge Awards event to recognize energy efficiency and benchmarking leadership uh, across the city. As part of the city energy project, Denver is also uh, working to engage tenants and businesses through their Lease for Efficiency Challenge. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, by signing up, businesses commit to asking about a building's Energy Star score when leasing space. Aside from the City Energy Project, there are a few other benchmarking programs in the works. There are many local governments with benchmarking programs or policies for public buildings. For example, the City of Las Vegas has begun benchmarking energy use uh, in its facilities using Portfolio Manager. There are also cities considering mandatory benchmarking ordinances for public and private buildings, such as the city of Boulder. Finally, uh, the, builder, the Building Owners and Managers Association, or BOMA, has initiated a series of local benchmarking competitions referred to as kilowatt crackdowns. Utah BOMA has recently launched a BOMA uh, kilowatt crackdown for the state, and Denver's equivalent is named Watts to Water and includes water consumption. There are now two 2030 districts in the southwest region uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Denver, Colorado. Uh, 2030 districts are public-private partnerships working to achieve aggressive emissions reduction targets in energy, water, and transportation. Uh, regional electric and gas utilities, uh, they offer several different types of incentives for commercial buildings and energy efficiency, so I'm not going to go through all of those. Um, but I'll just say that SWEEP works closely with all of our regional utilities to improve commercial offerings through design assistance, upstream incentives, and advanced technologies. Regarding data access, utility commissions in Colorado and Arizona are currently reviewing data aggregation rules for multi-tenant commercial buildings. Okay. For these last couple of slides, I just want to let you know about a couple of resources available from DOE. The Standard Energy Efficiency Data, or SEED platform, is a software application that helps organizations manage energy data from large groups of buildings. Um, so local governments or other groups uh, doing benchmarking programs are most applicable. Uh, the, the link to the SEED platform is listed here if you'd like more information. 
The Greenlease Library is a website with lots of commercial green leasing resources, so definitely check it out after the webinar. Uh, Andrew from IMT will talk about this in more detail since uh, IMT maintains the Greenlease Library. But here's the link and, and a screenshot from the website. And lastly, for your reference, here's my contact info. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions about today's webinar or if you'd like more information on our current projects. Uh, now we'll move on to Andrew Fearman from IMT. Thank you. Um, Lauren, thanks for that introduction. Uh, so everyone, I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit more about um, green leasing. Um, really why it's important uh, and how it can change the commercial real estate market. Um, so right now, um, I think I've shared my screen correctly. Uh, drop me a line in the chat if you still don't see things. Um, so you know, the important thing to know about green leasing, and I think we should really start uh, any discussion about green leasing with this, is that uh, you know, changing your lease terms on their own uh, does not does not achieve your goals. Um, what, what green leasing does is it makes whatever sustainability or energy goals you have uh, much easier. And it does that by altering uh, the traditional landlord-tenant relationship, uh, which in many ways is, has been adversarial uh, for, you know, in recent history. And when it comes to energy issues and sustainability issues, oftentimes it's a lot easier to uh, share in the costs and benefits of this measure, uh, rather than sort of fighting over who's going to pay for them. So really, a, a green lease is any lease in which the landlord and the tenant uh, agree to, again, as it says up here, uh, include sustainability concepts in their lease and you know, change the way that the cost and the benefits of those improvements are allocated. So here's just a little more detail about why you need to green the lease. And you, know, you can read through the steps yourself. Uh, but as I'll go into a little more detail on in a second, uh, the way your lease terms are set up, um, and it really depends on if you're a retail tenant or an office tenant or what market you're in, um, your lease terms determine uh, who pays for capital expenses or big ticket items like your you know, air conditioning or your boiler, um, and also determines you know, who pays for things like your monthly expenses, your smaller expenses like your utility expenses or uh, you know, the cost of cleaning your building. Um, so based on, I guess, how your lease is set up, um, you know, that's going to, I guess, change who has incentive to invest in sustainability. Sometimes it's the landlord, and, and in rare cases, uh, I would say it's the tenant. Um, here, hold on a moment. Let me just make sure that my slides are showing up full screen. Hopefully that's better. Um, so there's one thing that's important to focus on with green leases is that uh, the, the regulatory environment is, is changing with regards to energy. Um, so this, is, uh, this map right here is tracking um, how different jurisdictions um, have required um, or if they've required building benchmarking and transparency policies um, in the city. In the city, so uh, as you can see here, uh, benchmarking is something that's in many major markets already. Uh, and I can say that you know, in the past five years, um, almost all of these cities have come online with their benchmarking programs. So if you're not tracking your energy right now, uh, you might be compelled to or forced to uh, in the near future. Now, this is something that you, know, you really can't avoid these days as a savvy building owner or a large tenant. Uh, and it's important to get ahead of these regulations uh, by incorporating you know, energy and sustainability issues into your lease. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, the problem with the existing leasing market has been uh, the fact that uh, the owner and the tenant traditionally are fighting each other when it comes to lease negotiation. Um, it's really a case of you use as all the leverage that you have in order to push costs onto uh, the other party. Uh, so the owner doesn't have incentive uh, to invest in energy efficiency because the tenant is the one uh, who's traditionally paying for their utility bills. Uh, 
So if the owner spends money on an energy efficient um, upgrade, it's going to be the tenant who sees those savings on their utility bill. Uh, meanwhile, you know, the tenant in a building, even if they want to have a sustainable space in a green building, because they don't own the space that they're in, uh, they have no incentive to uh, upgrade their space, whether that means getting you know, energy efficient windows or even better lighting. Uh, those, any investments they make are going to leave uh, once they you know, vacate their space at the end of their lease. Um, so, so there's no incentive for either party to invest in energy efficiency. Uh, and the, the way that this uh, actually occurs in practice does change a lot uh, depending on your lease structure. Um, so uh, we do like to find out at IMT, um, you know, how different markets react to, to green leasing. And it's important for you to figure out before you even embark on this process, um, you know, what, what your lease should look like uh, in your portfolio, whether they're more on the full service side um, or on the triple net side. Uh, but the primary goal of a green lease, um, before I go into any more detail, is, is to eliminate the split incentives. And again, that's the case where the owner pays for capital improvement, uh, while the tenant pays uh, for utility bills and other operational expenses. And so, so again, the purpose of a green lease is to achieve your energy goals that might exist in your organization. Uh, you know, regardless of if you have green lease to sign or not. Uh, they're really a, a tactic to achieve the goals that you've already set. Uh, so uh, in a moment, I'll go over sort of the common activities that people undergo as part of a green lease. Uh, but I'll say that if you want to start this process and you realize that, you know, your leases are inhibiting um, some energy management, you know, you know, things that you want to do, a great way to to get this process started is, is just to get leasing teams and energy managers talking to each other. Uh, oftentimes, you know, real estate and finance folks are, are speaking one language, meanwhile facilities and energy managers are, are speaking another. And it's important to make sure that uh, they're not, uh, that they're on the same page and that they're speaking the same language. Because oftentimes they have similar goals, uh, but because their terminology or their metrics are different, um, they're, they're not able to get aligned. Another thing that we found is that companies often have broad uh, CSR or internal sustainability goals uh, that not everyone in their organization might know. And uh, doing your research on a company that you're working with or that you work for to find out uh, if they have any goals driven uh, from top level, um, especially in the case of CSR goals, um, is a good way to you know, incorporate leasing into some unusual parts of their of the company. And, Certainly, real estate is is one part of that. Uh, and finally, uh, you never know what you're going to find in your existing leases. Uh, we've had companies that wanted to embark on on green leasing and really get started, and they looked at their existing leases and they found that in a couple of their old agreements, they actually did have clauses that allowed them to um, recoup some of the money that they spent uh, on energy efficiency improvements. So some, um, I guess, examples of what you might see in a typical uh, green lease are, one, uh, limiting the uh, heating and air conditioning uh, hours within a building. Uh, oftentimes, buildings have been set up so that they turn their uh, HVAC systems on at 7 in the morning and shut them off at 9 at night. And, uh, you know, we know that certainly in most buildings and increasingly so uh, as people you know telework and do other things like that um, buildings are, are only op are only occupied for you know much smaller periods than that you know maybe they need to be heated and cooled for 10 hours a day instead of 14 uh, and that can have a very significant impact on how your building uses energy uh, but really comes down to a small change that you make within your lease um, what we've heard of in a lot of buildings is that they will have a, a shorter set period uh, where their heating and air conditioning is on. And then the building owner will, you know, happily turn on their core building systems, their heating and their air conditioning, 
either after hours or on a Saturday uh, if the tenant gives them you know, 24 hours notice. You know, that way the tenant feels like they can still access their building at all times. Uh, meanwhile, the landlord is able to cut down on their utility bills and improve the efficiency of the building uh, just by uh, turning off their systems a little earlier or turning them on a little later in the morning. Uh, another green lease clause that uh, we've seen a lot is just being uh, mandating energy data disclosure between the landlord and the tenants. Uh, as I mentioned earlier with the map, uh, more and more regulations are coming online across the country uh, requiring building owners to report their energy consumption in their building. Uh, but depending on metering structure of the building, it, it might be hard for a landlord to get that information from their tenants. Uh, so if you're a landlord, you can get ahead of these regulations uh, by requiring in your lease that when you ask the tenants for their utility information, they will share it with you, you know, within a reasonable time period. Uh, this also helps uh, in case a landlord is trying to uh, model energy savings or energy consumption uh, in order to make improvements to their building. Uh, and in general, sharing this information uh, you know, can, can prove to be beneficial to the landlord and the tenant uh, in a couple different ways, uh, depending on who they're working with or how their lease structure is set up. Um, the third one here on energy and data issues. Uh, traditionally, tenants uh, often are built only according to the amount of space uh, within the building that they occupy for their utilities. Uh, but we really think it's, it's more equitable to have tenants build according to the amount of energy that they actually use. You know, that way, if you are a smaller company and across the hallway from you is, uh, you know, a large tech firm that has a couple data centers, uh, you're not getting billed for their excess usage. Uh, the cost of submeters in the past uh, has been prohibitive to this practice, uh, but now they've come down to a price where one landlord based in California told us that they were able to install submeters in their tenant space for uh, 750 bucks uh, per tenant space. So when you, you know, break that down, uh, considering a tenant's utility bills, maybe over a three, five, or 10-year lease, uh, that becomes a very a low cost in order to um, better manage uh, your building, uh, make your tenants sort of happier that they're actually only paying for the energy that they consume, uh, and making them more behaviorally aware of the energy that they're using. Uh, and then the last one is um, having as buildings become more efficient with their core building systems, um, certainly uh, HVAC systems and insulation have really improved in effectiveness uh, over the last decade or so. It's become uh, more important uh, for buildings that want to be efficient to have efficient tenant spaces. And so what we've seen landlords do that are concerned about uh, efficient tenant spaces is they focused on the tenant build out as a place where they can get uh, a strong sort of basically a strong setup for the tenant so that they have an efficient space uh, and they generally will use uh, less energy than if they just went with a standard vanilla build out. Uh, so we've seen two major trends in this. Sometimes landlords just ask that a tenant not get LEED certified but build out to LEED commercial interior standards. Um, and then we've also seen landlords require that uh, if a tenant is building out a new space they not only build the code but they build to 10 or 15 percent better when it comes to energy issues uh, than coke. Um, so, you know, I hope this is not uh, a bore to, um, you know, any anyone on the call. Uh, but we just want to start out and give people some basic ideas for if you have no idea where to start with green leasing, uh, what can you do? Um, so the first thing is, if you're a tenant, is, is reach out to your landlord and, and see what sustainability uh, initiatives they have, if any. And the second thing is, is try and sub your space. Again, the, the cost is relatively low, and the best way to um, you start managing your energy consumption is to measure your energy consumption. Uh, and then, if you're a landlord, on the other side, uh, it's important to see what your tenants care about. Uh, oftentimes, you know, as a landlord, you can increase your tenant satisfaction by starting to invest and focus on energy issues. And also, uh, you know, landlords should benchmark their buildings. They should, uh, you know, use the resources that Sweep and others put out, um, you know, to help them put their buildings into portfolio manager. Um, and again, this will help you get ahead of regulation 
that may be coming online or, or will come online in the future in markets. <coughs> So here's just a short plug um, for a research paper um, that I just finished at INT. Uh, we looked at the overall impact that green leases could have uh, looking at all the different um, energy management clauses that could be included within a green lease. And what we found is uh, just by requiring um, certain, I guess, operational uh, changes to be had that you can control within your lease and traditionally have been part of either leasing negotiations or the building rules and regulations, uh, building energy consumption could be reduced by 11 to 22 percent uh, within U.S. office buildings. And certainly, uh, these concepts can apply to other markets as well if you're in the retail or industrial space. Uh, many of these concepts translate over. Uh, but, you know, office buildings are, are easy to pin down with their energy consumption habits. Uh, and so, you know, annually, annually, this could save the U.S. office market uh, 1.7 to 3.3 billion dollars. And now, as I'll explain now, um, saving money on your operational expenses can really have a huge impact on the value of your building. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, from the study that I just talked about, uh, one of our top-level findings was that you could save about 50 cents per square foot uh, in an office building just by incorporating uh, green clauses and requiring green operations within your lease. Uh, but due to the way that buildings are traditionally uh, appraised and sold, uh, by increasing or by saving, um, by cutting down on your costs operationally, what this does is it increases the operating income of your building and what you see Further downstream is that if you're a building owner uh, and you're looking to sort of increase the value of your building uh, on the margins, uh, this is something signing a green lease can save you uh, money in the short term, but really you would achieve a lot of your value when it's time to refinance or sell your building. Uh, and I'd be happy to explain this to anyone uh, after the webinar if, or later on in the webinar if you have questions about this. Uh, but as you see from this chart up here, uh, if you uh, save 50 cents per square foot uh, via energy measures, uh, this can lead to 10 times that value uh, later on when it comes to refinance or sell your building. Um, this was another study that a colleague did at IMT, um, and again, I'd be happy to uh, speak about it more with anyone uh, later on in the webinar or offline. Um, so, uh, as Lauren mentioned briefly, um, one thing that uh, we work on at IMT, along with the Department of Energy's Better Buildings Alliance, uh, is GreenLeaseLibrary.com. Uh, as you see from the logos up there right now, GreenLease Library is the result of collaboration amongst uh, a number of different stakeholders in the green leasing community. Um, and IMT just maintains it and continually updates it. Uh, the website, the goal of the website is really to be a, a one-stop shop for all audience types. Um, we have resources for building owners, tenants, um, lawyers, brokers, um, even have some stuff on the international realm um, for, I guess, anyone that may own or manage buildings um, outside the U.S. And really, Green Lease Library is a great resource for uh, anyone that's interested in green leasing uh, and incorporating this into their business practices. Uh, over the last five years, there really have been a lot of great uh, resources that have come out and a lot of really strong case studies that describe how different organizations have gone about this. Uh, and one thing you know you learn from uh, surveying the real estate world is that every market is different and every company is different. So when it comes to incorporating sustainability into their, their leases and their operations, and everyone's taking a different approach. So Green Lease Library uh, is a really great sort of online resource um, for people in in all stages of the process. Um, up here, these are a couple examples. Uh, on the left is a guide set up by a Better City Boston uh, that's really uh, tethered to the Northeast market. And on the right is uh, a guide that, that BOMA put out 
um, to help landlords and tenants sort of collaborate in the leasing process. Uh, these are just some examples of what Greenleaf Library has to offer. And there, for people that are looking to sort of heavy play leases, Greenleaf language, um, there's also a lot of examples um, on Greenleaf Library where you can just pull lease language uh, directly from some of the resources that you know later you could include into your lease. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to pass things off to Adam Knopf from Unico. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks everyone as I get my screen going here for taking your lunch hour to talk about green leasing. Uh, hopefully, I'm in full screen now, um, but Andrew or Lauren sent me a text if that's not happening. Uh, so Lauren and Andrew asked me to bring Unico's perspective to this whole thing, uh, really as kind of boots on the ground. We're doing green leasing every day and give uh, our perspective on how we do it and a little bit of our method. And as Andrew mentioned, it really is different for every company. So this is um, just one perspective on everything. Just keep that in mind. So uh, as Laura mentioned, I'm Senior Sustainability Manager for Unico Properties, uh, specifically Unico Sustainability. Feel free to tweet me or email me or call me with any questions or comments at any point. I'll show that at the end as well. Uh, we can skip this just because we're short on time. So to give folks a uh, quick background on who Unico is, uh, as Lauren mentioned, we're a commercial real estate investor and full service operator. Our three primary markets are Seattle, Denver, slash Boulder, we kind of count them as one. Uh, in Portland, Oregon, and then we also have sub-markets in Spokane, Salt Lake City, and most recently Austin, Texas. We're right around at about uh, 13 and a half million square feet. It's primarily commercial office, so there's a little bit of multifamily residential sprinkled in there. Something, just a, a caveat I want to throw out from the start, we're an investment company and we're also a manager, and that's a, a fairly unique uh, position that allows us to often take a longer term view when we're looking at efficiency projects or renewables projects or whatever it may be. Um, it also just opens the door for slightly more sophisticated projects because uh, oftentimes we are the equity behind the, a given project or a building. So <clears throat> it, it helps. Uh, that's not to say that everything I'm going to go through isn't possible if you're not in that position, but I like to throw that at the start. On the sustainability side of things, uh, we're a national USGBC gold member. Uh, we were part of the inaugural Green Leaders, uh, Green Leaf Leaders class in 2014. Uh, we're a National Energy Star partner, and we have leadership positions in both the Seattle and Denver 2030 districts, as well as the National 2030 Districts Network, so we're pretty involved on that front. Specifically to the sustainability side of things, uh, we've been incorporating sustainability into commercial real estate for right around a decade at this point. Um, our primary services, and this is by no means an all-inclusive list, uh, ranges on everything from energy efficiency project identification and development, uh, lead certifications. As Laura mentioned, we recently got into renewables, uh, set up our own PPA actually. Uh, Energy Star and ongoing performance analytics of measuring buildings, understanding uh, how they're performing and identifying opportunities for improvement. Uh, and all the services plus everything that's on that list, uh, we provide both to Unico owned and managed properties as well as complete third party clients that uh, Unico really has no ownership or management stake whatsoever. Uh, we're currently, uh, we've certified over 11 million square feet of lead space. so. Uh, we're pretty used to that. We currently have close to a megawatt of solar installed on buildings that we own and manage. And um, along with the statistic that Lauren gave about us, our portfolio being 34% more efficient, that correlates to about uh, $2.1 million in annual efficiency related savings across our portfolio, which helps the argument for sure. So Andrew has gotten into this a little bit. You know, no conversation about green leasing can really be had without a really basic crash course in just how commercial leases work. And um, because Andrew's gone through a bit of this already, I'm going to fly through it pretty quick here. Essentially, there's two very broad categories of leases. There's gross leases and uh, triple net, or sometimes uh, a version of that is a modified gross lease. Under a gross lease, if you're a tenant, you pay the exact same amount every single month, no matter what. If you use a ton of energy, you pay the same amount. If you use very little energy, you pay the same amount. 
Um, easy, predetermined cost, uh, pretty simple for everybody. And they tend to escalate at a set fixed escalator annually. Triple net and modified gross leases um, are a different beast. Basically, tenants pay their monthly lease, and then they are 100% responsible for all building expenses. They each month pay an estimated share of what those expenses will be for the year, and then at the end of the year, we reconcile that, and we either, um, well, we, it's never less. Uh, usually, people end up having to pay a little bit more for what the true expenses came out to. So if you're using a ton of energy at the end of the year, there's probably going to be uh, an additional utility bill, if you will. Uh, I think it's really important for folks that aren't in the commercial real estate world to understand that landlords are not choosing typically what type of lease to enter. It's really a market-driven uh, thing, and it's, it's kind of a, an interesting quirk of the commercial real estate market that you get to a market and they tend to be overwhelmingly one way or the other. And sure, there are times where you'll you know have a gross lease within a triple net market, but it would be a really specific case where um, something about that tenant or something about that building made it so you had to do it that way. So keep that in mind. You can't really tweak things to your, to your needs. Uh, along with the lease types, it's really important to talk about the two different broad categories of expenses that we have. Uh, and again, Andrew hit at this. We have capital expenses and operational expenses. Capital expenses are, you know, again, broadly defined as those that are really considered imperative or mission critical to the building. Um, another way to look at them is their projects that are so big that asset managers are going to attempt to capitalize that project. Um, you know, typical capital expenses include big things like a roof replacement, a boiler replacement, you know, large-scale HVAC overhaul, um, and life and health safety systems, things that you really can't do without. Uh, operating, operational expenses on the other side, uh, are kind of just the ongoing wear and tear, typical costs that go along with occupying the building. So utility expenses, ongoing R&M, repairs and maintenance, that sort of thing. Operational expenses are usually pretty easy to pass along to tenants, whereas capital expenses, it gets a little trickier because an argument can basically be made of, you know, I didn't cause that, the boiler is 30 years old, it had to be replaced no matter what, that sort of and obviously, the implication when you put these things together uh, is the split incentive, which uh, we're probably beginning to dead horse at this point. But gross leases tend to not really bring the split incentive up because if the landlord decides to put in a super efficient chiller and the building ends up saving on its utilities, that savings will probably come back to the landlord since the tenants are paying the exact same amount no matter what. Uh, triple net modified gross, obviously. Um, if a landlord decides to install a brand new chiller, the savings is all going to the tenants via their utility bills. And so right there you have a split incentive and then you run into to all the issues that come with that. So to dive into the meat of things here, uh, you know, what is green leasing? It, it's become, uh, just like the word sustainability, this really big beast of a phrase that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So I think it's important to just to think about you know, what purpose you're trying to accomplish with your green lease. Um, and it's probably best to do that from the start. So Andrew's gone through a handful of these, but some of the items that green leasing can address could be specifically overcoming the split incentive, um, funding the cost of green building certifications like LEED or Green Globes or Energy Star, um, gaining access to ongoing energy and water consumption data to understand um, building performance, uh, requiring waste diversion, that sort of thing. Uh, they can even get into really specific things like banning the use of um, space heaters that are, you know, energy hogs, that sort of thing. Unico's green lease addresses all of the above, plus things like space heaters. Um, but for the purpose of today, we're really just focusing on overcoming the split incentive. But keep in mind, the rest of those things are in there, and they tend to be a lot more straightforward. You can outright say, we're going to do this, or outright say, you are going, you know, you're hereby required to recycle, that sort of thing. It's pretty simple. When you get into overcoming the split incentive is where it really gets fairly complex. So, you know, a green lease is not as simple, uh, at least in our case, of just tacking on an addendum to the end of a lease and saying anything sustainability related tenants have to pay for. Um, it's really just like a lease, it's a carefully crafted legal document. And in our case, ours was really intended to work in tandem with our standard lease language. So it's really a a two-step process to really dumb it down, um, though in actuality probably 
many more. Uh, and step one is in the actual lease, and step two is, is the screen lease rider. So, you know, this first step here, um, again, this is just a, from a standard Unico lease. Uh, we're basically defining that any project that is deemed or, or targeted to save operational costs, the cost of conducting that project can be passed through can be passed through to tenants. So the specific language, uh, you know, for people that like legalese here is capital costs, including the, included in expenses, uh, including the cost of any capital improvements and modifications made to the building by landlord, and are intended to reduce expenses shall be amortized over such reasonable period as landlord shall determine. Basically, what that's saying is, if we're going to do a project and we think it's going to drive down costs, then we can bill tenants back for the cost of that project. Um, probably not all at once. We're going to amortize it over a, 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 what's deemed to be a fair amount of time. If we do this really well on any type of project, hopefully we can maintain the status quo for our tenants. So, you know, if a project's going to cost a buck a square foot and it's going to save 20 cents per square foot per year, then maybe we can amortize it over five years for the tenants and they can see no noticeable bump in their, uh, in their triple net charges at the end of the year. Um, step two is where we bring in the green lease rider. And basically there, we really define what those vague building expenses can include. And what we specifically say is these building expenses can also include um, all costs of maintaining, managing, reporting, commissioning, retro commissioning, or anything related to upgrading or being sustainable. So basically we're saying, we already made it clear that you're responsible for building expenses, and by the way, all of these sustainability-related items are hereby deemed building expenses that you're now required to pay. So to go back to you know philosophy class or a logic math class, it's really just a you know this, this, and therefore statement. So the the simplified sequence of events here is define which type of expenses are, are the responsibility of the tenant, stipulate that the cost associated with sustainability, excuse me, are determined to be in that same category. Therefore, sustainability costs are now the responsibility of the tenant. That's the very, very condensed version. Um, you know, this plays out in a lot of different ways. I should make the point that as a company's culture becomes more aligned with sustainability and efficiency best practices, you know, it's rare, if ever, that we hold a lease and a green lease rider in the tenant's face and say, see, do you see how you signed up saying you were going to do this? Most of the time, because sustainability has become so ingrained in the company, it's just an understood building expense, and it's understood as an operational expense that can therefore be passed along to the tenants, just like a roof repair would be or anything like that. So, you know, it's also about the culture of the company and, um, there are resources out there for that, but that's a whole different webinar. Uh, so just in wrapping up, that's me. Feel free to call me, email me, uh, anything. We can talk green leasing, and I will pass it back to Andrew here for Q&A. Yeah, so uh, if anyone has any questions, um, please uh, start putting them into the chat window now. Um, again, uh, everyone's uh, contact information is up on the screen now. Uh, we are all available uh, for, for questions um, you know, relating to our particular areas of expertise. Uh, one thing I'll say that I, I think uh, we all sort of touched on but didn't quite get into is that, uh, you know, I know in the, in the Southwest, uh, in some markets, energy, um, you know, and electricity reduction is, is a key thing uh, that a lot of uh, owners and governments are looking to focus on. And in other places, it's water. Uh, and I'll say that, you know, you can certainly uh, focus on water reductions with, within your green lease clauses. Um, and, and that's something that we've actually had a couple LA-based uh, landlords come to us and say that they've been really successful in doing. Um, you know, at the cost of water has been increasing pretty steadily in those markets. Uh, so the first question is from Tom Poling. Uh, he says, uh, if leasing types are driven by the market, 
uh, what's the incentive to drive a landlord towards green leasing? Um, and Adam, maybe you want to take a first try at that one. Uh, what drove Unico to, to start green leasing? Uh, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, you know, we use green leasing as a strategy to accomplish our bigger goals, essentially, is what drives us. It's not a market-to-market -market thing. So, you know, part of our goals, uh, we're a six-year company. We really believe in um, building a lasting positive legacy in the communities that we serve. And so green leasing is a strategy, like Andrew said before, to help us achieve those greater goals, which is, you know, reducing the impact of our buildings, um, which is our product, in a cost-effective manner, regardless of how the market basically says leases are going to take place. And to save operating expenses, that's a, a hugely important one that makes us competitive. Uh, so, let's see, Tom followed that up by saying uh, that if, if tenants are responsibility for sustainability expenses, uh, meanwhile, owners are the ones getting the asset value improvements. Uh, it seems like the landlord gets the benefit of the asset value while the tenant is paying for the sustainability costs, um, which might remove some incentive from the tenants. Um, yeah, this is that is very much uh, true in that um, certainly even after green lease clauses have been signed, uh, oftentimes uh, the tenant's utility bills for at least a, a portion of the time while the improvements are paid off they might not go down immediately. Uh, the thing that, that we often point to is that if you're a tenant uh, and as part of a green lease, um, the energy savings from a new HVAC system are being taken out of your reduced utility bills uh, so that your bills don't change. Well, as a tenant, now you have a brand new system uh, in your building and you're not getting any costs passed on to you uh, by the landlord above what you would have been paying even with the old system installed. Um, certainly, uh, in most markets, uh, the cost of building upgrades, which are just a part of business as usual, often do get pushed onto the tenant. Um, so while the tenant sees reduced utility bills in the long run, uh, they often get uh, more efficient and higher performing systems and higher quality space in the short run. Uh, and so for for a company, uh, you know, some of you might have heard the the three thirty three hundred rule. Um, for tenants, the appeal is, is not necessarily that they're going to save a ton on their utility bills right away, uh, but I think more on the side that if they have occupants that are happier, healthier, and, and more productive um, as a result of these improvements that the landlord is now enabled to do, uh, that's where they, they can find a huge value. And I would just, Andrew, follow it up by saying that, um, Tom, you're totally right, and we when we're performing energy efficiency projects, we um, the bottom line number we're ultimately looking at is residual value or asset value because oftentimes we don't see any savings. It's really just the same for us for the first you know five or ten years or whatever it is, and then ultimately we're playing kind of that investment card of what's in it for us is the added asset value. So that is definitely there. Um, see, we got a question from Valerie. Uh, she asks, um, do you have any examples of manufacturing facilities using green leases and what those solutions are? Um, sorry, yes, uh, you know, industrial facilities um, are, are often very specific, especially in what they use energy for. Um, so it really is more of a case-by-case -case basis there. Um, and certainly, they're also very regionally dependent from what I've found. Um, in certain cases, uh, you know, industrial buildings can spend, you know, a bunch of money on uh, heating and cooling if they're in an extreme climate. But in other cases, you know, that, that's not at all part um, of their expenses. Uh, and part of that is so extreme in industrial buildings uh, because, you know, they do have such high ceilings and are generally have large footprints. Um, we do have a couple case studies on that, and so uh, we should be in touch after the webinar. I don't know if any of you, if Lauren or Adam, you guys have examples of green leases in an industrial facility that you could add in here. Unfortunately, I don't. Uh, okay. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but we do have an industrial kind of team, so I could check with them. Okay.
Lauren, is you have a question about uh, pace upgrades, is that right? Oh. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, can you well, hear me, Andrew? Yes, I can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay, sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, um, so I was just asking about PACE financing and, and how that works with uh, the building owner versus tenant since it's kind of over time um, and if you guys have experience with that. So I can take a crack at it, Andrew. So PACE, which is Property Assessed uh, Clean Energy Financing, uh, it's slowly permeating the country and it's um, Colorado recently launched a statewide PACE district. Um, what it is, is for those that don't know, it basically allows you to finance the cost of energy efficiency or renewables projects uh, on via your tax bill. And so from a property owner and manager perspective, PACE is great because taxes, uh, there's no question that taxes, property taxes are a cost that gets 100% passed through to tenants, um, or not, maybe not, you know, based on square footage, so almost 100% passed through to tenants. Um, and so because those financing costs, that debt service is now on your tax bill. There's really uh, no compelling argument to the contrary to say that you can't pass those costs along to tenants. Um, and in terms of you know what that does to annual tenant expenses, that totally depends on your financing term. Um, if you you know took a 20-year term on on a project, then again tenants would probably see you know a negligible impact on their expenses because it'd be offset by the savings of the project, but if it was a short term, it could go up a little bit. Um, we're really strong supporters of PACE, and I'll, unfortunately haven't gotten to use it yet, um, but we're excited to, hopefully in the near future. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, we're at 3 o'clock. Uh, everyone, uh, thank you for joining us uh, for your lunch hour. Uh, again, our contact information uh, is, is up above, and uh, we will be sending out the slides uh, for this webinar as well as a recording of the webinar uh, for anyone that wants to uh, share it or post it uh, after this. Um, so again, uh, thank you all for joining uh, and thank you to Lauren and Adam for also being on the webinar today. Um, and I think that's it. We're all wrapped up. Thanks everyone. Thanks.